the Ashes doesn't always have two good teams. I suppose there have been times you could argue that it doesn't even have one. But at worst right now, it has two of the best three teams in the world. On top of that, England is the most interesting side in the world and probably also exciting. And English Ashes is something that usually gets more hype because both time zones can watch it and England has quadruple the amount of press covering it. Being that even terrible Ashes series are still hyped, this one was ticking over nicely before it even started. So to begin day one with a boundary was like throwing a lamb in the hyena enclosure. But when you look at this entire test match, it was about incredible stories all the way through. From the first ball all the way through to the last, they never ended. And think about that first delivery of the game. We had the story of Basball going up against Australia. Just on its own, this is incredible. Australia has been the most attacking team in the world throughout the, the history of the game. And England have largely been the opposite of that. So you could see why some Australians were a little bit skeptical that this would work. And what of the Australian team? I've often thought the bowling captains come in two styles. The rare, recklessly aggressive captains and the more pragmatic, keep the runs down defensive leader. Pat Cummins went to Pakistan with a 15 day marathon on his mind. I think we know his vibe. He can follow the ball a little bit as well and he likes to control the tempo of the game. When he saw Baz ball, he clearly spent months working out how many fielders he could actually fit onto the boundary. Other teams have been a bit more confused with Baz ball so far, but Cummins had a clear plan. He wanted to wrap the entire ground in a fire retardant blanket. He didn't quite manage that, but even in trying that, he seemed to upset so many people back in Australia. But one of the reasons it didn't quite work, of course, also was the pitch was so flat. Remember, this is what England wanted. The idea was to get a surface that would at least nullify one part of Australia's cricket. You could see the thinking. The flat pitches would mean that Australia's bowling, which is probably their strength, would have to do something different against England's new method. Then all their bowlers needed to do was find a way to chip away at the Australians. There are problems here. The pitch was probably slower than even the England batters would have wanted. And remember, it was very much about what they wanted. No one was that interested in the bowlers. Anderson and Broad are getting near hip replacement age. They probably don't want a home wicket that required subcontinental skills to snaffle a wicket. But the first part did work. Australia put fielders out, but England still scored a lot of runs and fairly quickly. But they didn't make enough runs to end the game there or score so fast that Australia was broken. But they certainly gave it a good go. And this wicket did suit Zach Crawley a lot as well. And he made runs, always important. Harry Brooks seemed destined for runs as well when he was bowled off his hip because he completely ignored where the ball was before it spun back onto his stumps. England were 176 for five at this point, suggesting that even with the flat pitch, the Australian bowlers were doing pretty well. That's when Bairstow came in. Now in his new role, which of course is really his old role, he is the keeper again. And that is why he was batting so far down the order. But this also means that Ben Folkes is not in the team. Did any of this matter as Bairstow moved England into a good position? No, probably not. But as handy as Johnny was, it was really Joe Root who did the damage. Partly because while Australia's defensive plan made sense and actually probably nullified some of the England players, against Root, they allowed for singles and Root took singles. Now in truth, I think he's the hardest player to scheme for in basketball. For the same reason he was the hardest player to bowl against before basketball. He is just better than any other English batter. And Australia just could not get him out. But of course, they didn't have to because England declared. Who knows how many runs England left out there. They wanted to baz with ball in hand, but they didn't take a wicket and we will never know how many runs it cost them and ultimately how important that whole moment would be for the game. The second day exploded because of Stuart Broad. Instead of ripping through Warner with an unplayable ball worthy of artwork, like pretty much everything in 2019, he delivered a wider ball that Warner went after. And luckily for Broad, two things happened. The ball did actually see him back quite a bit, but mostly what helped was that Warner executed his shot terribly, almost falling over on what looked like a fairly standard slash to the offside. There were two problems for Australia. The crowd got going, but also that might get in Warner's head again. But the crowd got a lot louder the next ball when Broad dismissed Marnus Labuschagne, perhaps using his new special outswinger that he was talking about before the series. But it put Australia well behind in this match, a position they would stay for a long time no matter how much they clawed back. England stayed in front of the game even as Bairstow missed many chances. Even his catches had an element of roughness about his feet and hands. But it meant that the conversation about whether he should have taken the gloves from Ben Folkes won't end with this level of glove work, even if he was part of the reason that England got in front in the first place. 
It's worth noting that this was a low down, dirty game almost all the way through. There was a lot of tension involved. But for the second time in this game, Harry Brook made everyone laugh. I can't think of anything more test cricket than Harry Brook running into bowl to Steve Smith. And Brook seemed to be parodying himself and had no place bowling and over in this level of a contest. More importantly, Travis Head comes out to bat, and even though England has a slow pitch and even slower bowlers, they still bounce him. He doesn't always look comfortable, but it's still quite weird seeing a specialist batter get bounced with bowlers who look like they are delivering a nerf ball. At the same time, Moen Ali's comeback, which is an incredible news story just on its own, seems to be going pretty well when he rips one sideways through the gap to bowl Cameron Green. When you see Moen Ali bowl like that, you can understand why England would bring him straight back into the side. Is this the moment that England are sure they unretired the right guy? But as good as Moen bowls, he can't take the wicket of Usman Khawaja. Now, it is fair to say that while there is a lot of chat at the moment about Khawaja conquering England, there was absolutely nothing typical and local about this wicket. So that part of it is weird. And also, England bowled to him using their strengths and not attacking Khawaja's weaknesses. However, those things might be true, but Usman Khawaja was fantastic. His judgment and temperament were absolutely brilliant all the way through, and he seemed to understand the one great truth about this pitch. It wasn't hard to stay out there. It was just hard to bat normally and stay out there. And of course, Khawaja was continuing his good work over the last couple of years. But you could see what this means to him. The bat drop or bat throw was an explosion of feeling for a man who has been an Australian yo-yo in this team. Of course, he made it more fun when he brought his daughter to the press conference as well, winning the PR game as well as the game on the ground. The Khawajas were taking over Edgebaston. And at the beginning of day three, Daddy Khawaja was still the main story. At first because he was making runs, but more because he was dismissed by Ollie Robinson and Ben Stokes as they found a way to trick him using weird fielding positions and the odd slow ball. But then Robinson went and ruined this work by screaming at Kawaja. Firstly, screaming at someone who has made a very big hundred is a very stupid thing to do in any stage, ever. Because it always makes you look like the idiot. However, in Robinson's case, considering his past and the joke he made about Muslims on Twitter, I just don't think that Usman Kawaja is the right player to be abusing here. If nothing else, because Robertson allowed for everyone to bring up these facts again. But it also wasn't the only weird thing on this day that included Robertson. Because after Kawaja went out, it was the second time in the game that England used him as a short ball enforcer. Originally, it was against head. But this time, it was for the tail. And even more weirdly, it worked. Australia really haven't had a tail like this consistently since 1991. And the slowness of the wicket and the bowls actually played against them as they couldn't really hook sixes to get the pressure back on England. And they also couldn't get out of the way of the ball. It meant that Australia had no tail to speak of. England got off to a reasonable start when the rain came. And when they came back out to bat, it was dark, the clouds were in, and Boland is suddenly jagging the ball all over the shop. England's plan of coming down the wicket too doesn't really work as well when he's moving the ball this much. And Australia take a couple of quick wickets to at least put the game to close to even for the first time in quite a while. And if there hadn't been more rain, they might have actually made a bigger dent in England. Instead, it rained pretty much the entire afternoon. For day four, England never really got going in their third innings. It's weird because generally that is where you expect them to really attack. Especially with the threat of rain on the final day, and they were now a little bit worried about actually getting a result. But I'm not sure that the wicket completely allowed them to do that. The only time it looked like England might completely break free was when Brooke took on Lyon. But in the end, Cummins' regular breakthroughs using swing kept England's total low. It's also interesting that he was swinging it and not using the wobble ball. Probably a good sign that the wicket was completely dead that he had to use the air. And if you didn't think the wicket was completely flat, certainly when you're at least defending on it, you could have a look at England's tail. Robinson, Broad and Anderson ensured that a possible lead of 240 ended up around 280. But it did also completely cement the thought that this pitch wasn't easy to get wickets on if you weren't playing any shots which I suppose gave Australia a chance. Because if it did rain on the final day, it meant that there was always a chance of a draw now for them as well. It's not easy to go from a few T20 overs and some net bowling to a huge bell in a test using a pronounced seam like the Dukes. And so once his finger opened up, it meant that trying to spin a ball with an open wind on your finger is basically impossible. So at this point, England was without a frontline spinner. Again, and Australia took advantage of the pitch and Moen Ali's finger to make their best opening partnership in England since 2015. Is that a sign that Warner is slightly back to form? Or was the pitch so dead that it just wasn't the kind of wicket that could show his weaknesses? But importantly, Warner didn't go out to Broad. This was his second micro Broad Maraud in this test. He took Manus again with another full outswing delivery, which seems to be a pattern. 
It meant that at close, Australia had Scott Boland at the crease and their three biggest names were gone. And so, of course, the last day would start with England on top. But Boland does a decent job of taking up a few deliveries, but also more importantly, edging and squidging and getting the ball off the main square out to the outfield, which was wet from the morning rain. It was certainly enough to get the ball stopped swinging. And it was moving around the night before. When Boland was out, it was Travis head time. And here, England gave Moinelli another go. And it started terribly. He could barely land the ball. And as it was coming out of his fingers, he seemed to have no real idea where it was going to end up. And then just as it looks like that might be his last over of the entire day, he gets two balls in the right spot. They both spin a little bit, both take the edge, and the second one is caught. That means that even a damaged Moeen Ali has dismissed head twice in this match. And again, a reminder of why Australia didn't want him to play in India. But at the other end was still Kawaja, who remember was the man people were less sure about for England. But on this surface, it felt like all England could do really was slow him down. They put out the Yorkshire wall in full umbrella mode. And for the spinners, they also used a field of a straight hit, which of course really should be called straight on. This meant that against pace and spin, Kawaja had less chance of scoring boundaries. But it still didn't really look like he was going to be dismissed, which meant that if he stayed there the whole game, Australia were going to win. Then Ben Stokes came on. He took Smith in the first innings and certainly played with the field a lot throughout the game. And there was the whole declaration thing. But even so, notice how little he has factored into the narrative of this test. But just as it looked like Kawaja might win the match, Stokes was bowling at Ollie Robertson speeds, and you could hear his knees creak over the crowd in the holly stand. Suddenly he rolled a gentle leg cutter towards Kawaja, who dragged it back onto his stumps. Even a broken Ben Stokes can still make a breakthrough, it turns out. And at the other end, Joe Root took a wicket as well. He would end up with one for 58 in the match. And yet there is still plenty of noise for him to be the number one spinner going ahead. And remember when Joe Root took his wicket, that is when England should have won this test match. And ultimately, that is exactly where they lost it. This Australian tale has been struggling for a long time. It wasn't just that they were bounced out in the first innings. Even Mitchell Stark has struggled over the last couple of years. But no one with batting talent has been more disappointing than Pat Cummins. In 2017, he averaged 26 with a bat. And since then, we've seen incredible hitting of pace bowling in T20. And yet in tests, he hasn't had a single year of averaging over 20 since that comeback year. And at the other end, you had Nathan Lyon, who is a compulsive puller and hooker on a slow wicket with slow bowlers. Chances are he wasn't going to middle ball enough to get it over the top of anyone, especially with England having near Wagner field. That means that these two players had to make over 50 runs with only Hazelwood behind them. It was never going to be easy. In fact, it looked fairly impossible at that point, especially for some people who had been questioning Cummins' toughness because he thinks global warming might be an issue. And yes, that is quite a stretch and a weird take to have. Remember that after the first innings where he tried to stop England scoring boundaries, he really upset the five slips and one gully crowd from Australia. And the biggest slight you hear on Cummins is that he is not an alpha male. That unlike the mustachioed hairy men of the past with their shirts unbuttoned, he is soft. Okay then, but let's just recap the last couple of weeks. He just helped Australia win the World Test Championship. On day one against what is one of the weirdest trends we have ever seen in test crickets, he went against the consensus and still managed to keep his team in the game. When his trusty wobble ball wasn't working, he just pulled a 90 mile an hour in swinging Yorkers out of his back pocket. In the first innings, he was happy enough to just take the ball on the body from Stuart Broad. And on the final day, he had to basically win the entire game on his own. It was a near one man stand. And he knew through all of that that he would get bounced and hit. And also that one mistake would likely lose the test and perhaps make it very hard for them to win this series. And yet, Pat Cummins still went hard. He was completely fearless and even took on the spin of Root, which has never been his happy play. And because of all this, he appeared to actually break the Baz Ball style of England. At one stage, they had seven men on the boundary to Cummins. And they even gave him a single off the last ball of the over. Pat Cummins won a lowdown and dirty test match that went right down to the wire. There are many stories in this match, but by the end, it was Cummins who won the day.